right now on Cast Confessions, The Facts of Life. Good news about me is getting repetitious. <laughs> it was one of the definitive sitcoms of the 80s, and we got every dirty and hilarious <laughs> detail from the cast and crew themselves. You know I'll talk smack, so you know, I will. From the train wreck first season. There were seven girls, plus teacher and the headmaster and Charlotte. It was like carnival. To the cutthroat decisions that saved the series from extinction. Of course, as the only black person, we the first to die in a movie. So of, co of course, I'm like, I bet you I ain't going back. To the drastic measures they took to keep these girls in line. Every day when producers and the writers would gather around the scale and I would have to get on there so they could see whether I had lost or gained any weight that day. Plus, sex scandals. It's just ridiculous. You can't have these girls having all these boyfriends and nobody does anything. Foxy guest stars. Hi. Hi. You know, I have often said that if I had known he was going to turn out as fine as he did, I may have worn makeup to the set more often and the shocking departure of the woman who started it all. They wanted me to stay a couple more years. They offered me millions. It's all coming up on Cast Confessions, the facts of life. 1979, President Jimmy Carter is in the White House. Michael Jackson releases Off the Wall. Mother Teresa wins the Nobel Peace Prize and a sitcom hits the airwaves that'll give prime time some serious girl power. The Warner is like a delicate souffle. Yeah, white and empty. <laughs> Facts of Life was one of those just quintessential 80s shows. These are our golden girls, they're our designing women, they're our sex in the city. They were that for that period of time. For an entire generation of young women in this country, it's sort of a defining show for them. People come up to me and go, okay, Facts of Life was totally my guilty pleasure. Sent people into a dark room to watch it when nobody could discover them, but enough people watched them that they stayed on the air. Ultimately, the television audience had the last word, and they identified with the characters, and they watched, and they watched for a really long time. When Facts of Life started, NBC was in a very precarious state. It was really trying to figure out what it was going to become in the 80s, basically. I think the highest rated show at that point was Different Strokes. It was the only comedy that was working on the network. The show came from the idea of doing a spin-off with the housekeeper from Different Strokes moving over to the other show. It was a, a classic kind of uh, spin-off. He said, look, the network wants to spin you off on a new series. The concept was simple. Mrs. Garrett would land a second career as a house mother in the private Eastland School in Peekskill, New York. But what's a house mother without a house full of girls? Now, if you're in a school, you're going to have to have a lot of girls. And that was the original thought. We didn't even really have a script yet. We weren't sure what any of the girls were. We were hoping everyone would bring a certain persona with them. My audition for Facts of Life was very interesting. I was nine years old, and I had been working since I was about seven. I was the only black girl that had auditioned for the show, and I was kind of runtish in terms of my size, and I just thought, what am I doing here? Take me home, Mom, take me home. I don't belong here. And my mother politely took me to the restroom and would tell me, you know, don't let anyone or anything intimidate you. You just go and do your best. And they liked what I did. Originally, the part of Blair was for a fast-talking, naive girl from Texas. But there was one line in the audition process that I looked over at the girl beside me, who happened to be Sue Ann, and I made some kind of snide reference to her backside, perhaps being large. He sounds heavy-duty. Not any more heavy-duty than you, dear. <laughs> and they liked the reading so much that when I eventually come to the table reading for the pilot episode, they had rewritten the entire character around that one line reading. So now she was a very stuck up, sophisticated girl from New York. It wasn't long before the remainder of the cast had fallen into place. Felice Schachter landed the part of sophisticated girl next door, Nancy. St. Louis native Julie Pekarski became the boy crazy beauty, Sue Ann. The role of tomboy Cindy was filled by Julianne Haddock. And for the fast-talking Molly, they plucked a then-unknown actress from an off-Broadway cast of Annie named Molly Ringwald. 
The cast of Facts of Life was nearly complete, but there was one last actress to join the mix, and they found Mindy Cohn in the most unlikely place, an actual girls' school. We weren't looking for any more cast members. We weren't looking for girls, but we wanted to find out how they felt about things. What's it like to go to a school with no boys? What's it like to wear a uniform? I was with a gaggle of girls. We sat, we talked for about an hour. I kept going back to this little girl, Mindy Cohn, because she was so adorable, and she had that adorable little voice. I'd ask her a question, and she'd go, <laughs> well, uh, I don't know, but uh, it seems to me that, and she's so cute and funny. And I said, she'd be a great compliment to those other girls. Next day, I get a call from the headmaster's office is saying, these people want to talk to you. And Charlotte said, I have fallen madly in love with you. I want to create a role for you on this show. We're going to call you Natalie. And do you want to do this? And I was like, I don't know. I'm in eighth grade, lady. Like, what do I know? Is this going to, like, mess with my tennis team schedule, you know? They asked me to meet her. And so she came in. And I remember her saying, please, please talk my parents into this. <laughs> so we did. And she got the part. I walked into the office. There was the casting director and Charlotte and Gary Coleman, uh, who I was just like, oh my god, it's Arnold. You know, I was totally starstruck. And Kim was in there. I totally remember meeting Mindy. And I couldn't believe that she had never been on TV before. And I was like, wow, they just picked her up out of a school? <laughs> How did that happen? Well, you know, where's your classes and, <laughs> and that sort of thing, your acting training? I literally got the call sheet for the next day. Like, they were starting. Putting together a great cast is one thing, but putting on a show is something else entirely. And that first season saw a whole lot of unintentional sitcom mayhem on set and behind the scenes. The show had a really rocky start. I mean, the scripts were really not great out of the gate. It can be difficult when you have a large cast. The writers need to develop stories, and of course the actresses want to have stories, and what's the point of having somebody wander around if they ne never do anything? There were seven girls, plus John Lawler and Jenny O'Hara, who was the teacher, and Charlotte. It was like carnival. Rehearsing the facts of life was like choreographing a ballet. There were so many of us that, you know, downstage, upstage, and we had to like have everyone just in the right place and crossing at the right time so we didn't bang into each other. It's very difficult. In the first season, the show was pretty disorganized. There was a show that we shot one week and then turned right around and shot the exact same episode a second time to make it better because it really was a train wreck the first time. I've never seen it before. Once we started filming the show, first of all, there was just a lot of people. Being the youngest and the smallest, it can feel, you know, kind of overwhelming. The character was to be 12 years old, and I was nine, and I was a small nine. And so they put me on roller skates the first season of the show so that I was taller. I had to roller skate around in a rehearsal hall to show them that I could actually function <laughs> on skates. I think in the beginning, she learned how to stop by almost just not crashing into things, being how you just kind of slam into it, catch yourself. And eventually, I think they got her stoppers, or she learned at least how to stop a little more gracefully. They didn't say anything about going up and down, you know, stairs and that sort of thing. That was kind of trial by error. But you try coming down some, <laughs> some of them steps and some roller skates. <laughs> Oh, the joy of Children's Hospital. <laughs> and while Kim had trouble staying on her feet, Mindy had even bigger problems. Mindy didn't have the technique early on, and she had not gone to acting school. I just remember being in the rehearsal hall and the director saying, OK, Mindy, if you can just go upstage. And I must have looked, you know, I went deaf, dumb, and blind. I was like, I don't know what, you know. I've taken chemistry, but I have never heard upstage, you know? And I remember Kim just going, Go, just just take two steps up that way. And she goes, I got your back. Hilarious. How, how bold was I at nine years old telling someone who was a little bit older than me, oh, I got you. <laughs> I can help you. I'll, I'll work with you. You'll be all right, kid. Stick with me. <laughs> she was a natural when it came to delivering the lines. But where you could tell she had just been plucked from the school was when she would then laugh at her lines or say them while smiling. And it took her forever to overcome that. There was a scene where she had a line uh, where we were all caught drinking. <gasps> You've got beer and wine. <laughs> Mindy has this big smile on her face. Like, she, you could see her chuckling going, and wine. And I cracked up. 
the executive saw that and from then on, my note was always like, stop smiling and she's cracking herself up. While the cast fumbled through that first season, the show fared even worse in the ratings. The facts of life hit the airwaves on August 24, 1979, and the initial response was anything but positive. From what I recall, it was kind of a sputtering start. The show did not do very well when it first came out. It did not have good ratings. The reviews weren't so good either. One reviewer even called it worthless and barren and even said that this is going to be the show that is going to ruin NBC as a network. There was a sense that, you know, this may not last. Coming up, the cast gets some devastating news. I remember when the call came, I was in the basement of my home, and I couldn't believe it. When Cast Confessions returns. But first, a cast quiz. <laughs> no. <laughs> you gotta make them easy. Oh, but not Buttercup. Uh, I remember that episode, that's first season in the barn. We had to get her out of the barn because it was raining. I remember the whole episode, but not that. No, what's his name? Chestnut? Oh, it's not anything like Buttercup. What are you kidding? Chestnut. With a charming cast of young actresses, The Facts of Life hit the airwaves in 1979, but the first season saw havoc on the set and confusion in the scripts. Viewers and critics were not impressed. The network gave them a second chance and one more season on the air. But there would have to be big changes if this series was going to survive. The first year was very shaky, and there's no way it would have been given the chances that it was given back then in today's climate. But from what I understand, NBC was pretty desperate at that time for shows. We didn't have a lot of shows that were working on the schedule. When you're a last place network, you, you tend to give shows a lot longer time to find their legs. My writing partner, Linda Marsh, and I had written several episodes of One Day at a Time, and they liked our work. So they asked us to come in for an interview, and they had us watch episodes of Facts of Life. He said, so what do you think of the show? And we said, well, we have three issues. The first issue is that we felt the show was close to being kiddie porn the first season because they had girls in short shorts and tight tops doing cartwheels in the middle of winter. You have to remember in 1979, when you're looking at television, you're thinking about the biggest hits, Three's Company and Soap, the Charlie's Angels, these shows that have sex all over them. So that was all over television in the late 1970s. We were sexed up a bit. We really were. We were wearing short shorts, and I was wearing tight, tight jeans. Hey, when Roger sees me in these, he'll go crazy. <laughs> the shorter, the tighter, the better. There were times when we would run up the steps, we'd have to run up to our rooms, and I remember kind of running and kind of tucking under my bottom to make sure nothing was showing. One day, we were backstage waiting, and there was a hookup where you could hear what they were talking about in the control room. And myself, some of the other girls were listening, and we heard the producers commenting about our clothing. And I was like, we shouldn't be saying things about really young girls like that. Sex sells, even if you're 15 years old. <laughs> it was really offensive to us. If that's what it was, we would just not work on the show. The second thing is you gotta get Tootie off those roller skates. And they said to us, well, she's so short, the camera can't see her. And we said, nobody wears roller skates in the house. And we said, the third thing is that the girls, there's too many of them. Their personalities are so close that we think you need to cut down the number of the girls. They began to realize that certain girls were emerging and that there was something missing and that it required releasing a few of them. There was this creative meeting, the Facts of Life Summit, very much like NATO. Let's narrow it down to four types that we can create robust characters around and tell stories about. It was a bold plan to save the flagging sitcom, but a painful decision would have to be made. Which actresses would stay and which would go? They called and said that they were going to make some changes, and even at age nine, I was like, uh oh am I gonna go? 
Of course, as the only black person, I mean, you know, we the first to die in a movie. So of, co of course, I'm like, I bet you I ain't going back. And so I was surprised when they told me that I was coming back in the revised version of the show. I found shooting the series, the focus there was Lisa, Mindy, and Kim. But we had stories that dealt with the other girls, but they didn't seem to click. They got rid of Molly, who, like, five years later, she was on the cover of Time magazine. They got rid of Nancy. They got rid of Cindy, and they got rid of Sue Ann. I remember when the call came, I was in the basement of my home, and my mother turned to me and said, you and Molly and Julie and Julie are not going to be, and I couldn't believe it. And at that age, I took it personally. I took it very personally. Being, I guess, kind of the naive person I am or whatever, I was like, oh, wow, well, I would love to say goodbye, you know, and, and do that kind of thing. And they're like, OK, that's not how it's done out here in LA in showbiz. You know, it's like, thank you, but we're moving on. The executives never talked about it. Well, she sucked, and we didn't know what to do with her. It wasn't about personalities. It was always about the show. And then they told us that they were going to be adding a new character and that we should go see the movie Little Darlings. They wanted to uh, have a character that was really a contrast to the wealthy, snobby girl, which was, you know, a tough, earthy biker chick. Little Darlings was the inspiration for the character of Joe because you had Christy McNichol playing the scholarship case opposite Tatum O'Neill, the rich preppy. They came to us and they said, we're gonna call the new girl Foxy. And we said, oh God, no, we really hate it. And so they gave us a list of girls' names for the new scholarship student who was going to come in and shake things up. And we said, gosh, we don't like any of these names at all. And the executive producer at the time said, you know, the four girls and the house mother, it's like little women. It's like, what about a name like Joe? So we had the auditions. It was down to two girls, and one of them was Nancy. Nancy McKeon had done some episodic work. Um, she was getting some good reviews. She was in a Hallmark commercial where she cried on cue. But if she wanted to land the part, Nancy would have to wow them at the audition. I remember sitting in the booth and being very, very impressed with her work. And then the question in the room came up is that can she be vulnerable? She had to do a telephone call to her mother and where her mother was telling her that she's got a new boyfriend. I asked Nancy, as Joe, could she do that telephone scene and not cry? It was written cries. And she said, okay. I mean, like it was nothing. Yeah, hi, Mom. Yeah, I'm fine. Who's Jack? Oh, yeah? How long has he been living there? She did it, and I want to tell you, in the control room, the people from NBC and everybody else who were behind me, you could hear them going, <laughs> you know, and then reaching for handkerchiefs. We all went, that's it. So I thought to myself, well, there's no way in the world this girl is not going to get this role, and she did. Talk about a brilliant move in casting. She was akin to when they brought in Heather Locklear to Melrose Place or Kelsey Grimer to Cheers. Linda and I wrote a script. That was the heart and soul of Facts of Life. And that was the one where Blair thinks she's going to the cotillion with the handsome, blonde, rich boy. And he gets one look at Joe and says, oh, scholarship student, she'll be easy. I can have my way with her. And he instead asks Joe to the cotillion and essentially tries to date rape her. And Blair rips him a new one. Guess I better leave. <laughs> no, Buster, you stick around here. I'll dick you. Oh, Blair, Blair, Blair. Almost instantaneously, you could see chemistry. Just absolute. I think the writer saw it, the producer saw it. Like, these two are oil and water, and it's fabulous. This is a sisterhood here. And establishing that sisterhood really gave the show its spine. 
season two certainly was a big turning point for the show. About mid-season of the first season with Nancy, ratings started to go, and NBC as a network started to really kind of do well. All of a sudden, oh my gosh, we're in second, and we actually can become the number one network. There was a lot of excitement, young energy. Facts of Life had that same kind of energy around it. Coming up, the producers face a growing problem they can't contain. The producers tried everything from hiring a nutritionist to come to the set to hiring somebody to come to my door every morning at 6 o'clock to run with me. I wanted to say, save your money. I just like food. When Cast Confessions continues. But first, a cast quiz. A motorhome. She moved to West East Lake. I think it was in Wisconsin, wasn't it? Africa! I know that one. She went with her guy to Africa? Okay, phew. <laughs> Did she really? Didn't she live in a motorhome though? <laughs> and I just knew that one was right. After a rocky first season in 1979, the Facts of Life rebounded with a smaller cast of cute and charming young actresses. The addition of Joe, the tough kid with a tender heart, helped focus the flagging series and turn it into a hit. But little girls grow up. And by the third season, the series was experiencing what could only be called growing pains. You start to see over the course of the second season that the Eastland vests are starting to get a little tight. And it's not just that we've got budding womanhood on set. We've got some, you know, some size issues. When you hire girls and they become women, as you go through puberty and things start to happen, and here's what happens. All the girls at different times gained or lost weight. Very much a conversation around the production company. There was concern. I remember we were doing an episode where the girls were supposed to be in swimsuits, and none of them would get into them. They were all heavy. We did everything under the sun, as you would do with a pregnant woman, walk behind a couch, do a thing, you know. I think Lisa had the hardest time because she had started as sort of the prettiest of them, and when she started gaining weight, it was really tough on her. They cast me to play a character that looked a certain way, and when I signed on the bottom line, I looked that way. So I do not at all blame them for being understandably upset when I went through puberty on camera. This got very mean-spirited in terms of what people would say. As a cast, we did the Hollywood Christmas Parade. I remember just waving and having, we were having so much fun and somebody from the crowd said, hey Blair, you're getting fat. For me, that hurt my feelings a lot. Joan Rivers coined the phrase, the fats of life. And it was hurtful. There would be times, you know, we would pick up National Enquirer and there'd be an article about the fats of life. Or Joan Rivers would be guest hosting on The Tonight Show and talking about those fatties and especially that, you know, bundle of blubber Blair. It didn't seem to seriously hurt the ratings. The fats of life controversy probably helped the show. It drew attention to it. Getting press, getting comedians talking about you, whatever they say, is, is awfully important. All of us were racking our brains how to uh, talk them into exercising more, eating less, eating more healthy, whatever. The producers tried everything from hiring a nutritionist to come to the set to make sure I had healthy choices, to hiring somebody to come to my door every morning at six o'clock to, you know, to run with me. The producers tried to have like a real healthy craft service area and like fruits and all kind of stuff and you know take away the cookies. They ended up just basically circumventing that by going to their cars during breaks and, and having chocolate bars. The production company at one point said you know everybody has some issues so we're going to have a hypnotist there for a few days in the offices and anybody who wants to see him can. Any problems you might be having with your parents, your scale, your pets, your scale. I'm going to say, save your money. I just like food. Then they took another tactic and they would bring the scale into the rehearsal hall so that every day when I came to work, the producers and the writers would gather around the scale and I would have to get on there so they could see whether I had lost or gained any weight that day. They were desperate, but they could not make me 
lose the weight. Everybody's grabbing at straws instead of, you know, realizing um, we're teenage girls and this is kind of what happens to our bodies. Weight gain may have compromised Blair's ultra-perfect image. Good news about me is getting repetitious. <laughs> but the truth is, Lisa Welch was anything but a polished prep school preppy. Sometimes we would make fun of Lisa because she was such the complete opposite of her character. If she was walking down the street, you'd never go, hey, that's... No, you don't. <laughs> you don't think that at all. There were days that I didn't even want to get out of bed early enough to take a shower which was fine, except that my hair would look greasy. So, but I learned that just to put a little baby powder in the part, then it kind of absorbs some of the grease. Lisa would come in with cargo pants, which weren't in at the time, okay? Weren't cute yet. With a book in each pocket, her hair dirty. She'd put baby powder in her hair to take the oil. I mean, she was just hilarious. But quirky personal hygiene wasn't the only thing that made Lisa stand out from the rest of the cast. Lisa was the kind of performer who, just show me where I'm going. OK, leave me alone. See you in four days. Lisa didn't like the rehearsal process, but once she got it, she didn't want to go over it and over it and over it. Every actor works differently, which is frustrating. Some of the speeches we didn't know at times whether the material would work. People would rush and go, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I go, no, 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 trust me, it'll work. She'll, she'll deliver it. She liked to read a lot on the set. And sometimes she would do it like in the scene. And it's like, OK, it's your line now, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, one day we just kind of all said, it's kind of, you know, awkward when you're reading and we're trying to do the scene. My first instinct was oh, just big tears and, you know, how dare they? I'm doing my job. And then it took about five minutes for me to realize that was just totally selfish of me and unprofessional. And I was glad that they said something. While the cast worked out their differences backstage, the series was becoming a hit. But in season five, Facts of Life nearly lost one of its biggest stars. When you start a show, different actors and actresses come at a different salary structure because they've had different experience levels, especially if they're younger, like we were in this show. But there was one situation with Nancy. She essentially went on strike for more money. Nancy had gained a lot of popularity. She sort of came from nowhere, and the character of Joe became a huge success. So she did want to renegotiate. Her management felt that she needed to get more than they were willing to give, so she staged kind of a mini walkout, and there were threats of lawsuits. Nancy was a no-show for two whole episodes while her paycheck problems were resolved. That season, she wasn't in the first couple episodes until that was settled. Sitcoms have all kinds of ingenious ways to cover for things that are going on behind the scenes. So in this case, the Joe character was at home for the weekend. You just didn't see her. That would have been difficult to maintain if she'd stayed out for a season or a half a season. The opinion about it was, that's a shame. That she's not coming to work because of that is stupid. Not stupid on Nancy, but that's like the cameraman not coming. How are you going to shoot it? She's an integral part of our cast, so fix it and resolved by paying her for the episode she didn't perform in, as opposed to upping her salary. They basically said, we can't change the whole structure of the show for you, so let's call it a day and you'll stay at the same structure as the other girls. Finally, they arranged all the salaries to reflect everyone's popularity. It was Nancy's representation's way of saying, these girls are really underpaid for what y'all are making. We need to work something out. It just could have been handled differently, but that's no fault of Nancy's. That's just the nature of girls not talking about money with each other. And when we did, we fixed it. Coming up, why in heaven's name would Blair boycott the show? I kind of went up to one of the producers and just said, I can't do that. Um, I'm a Christian and I can't do it. When Cast Confessions returns. But first, a cast quiz. What show are you talking about? What? Oh my gosh. I don't remember. Start with an R? I know, it starts with an S and it has a K sound in it. The rock singer that Joe. I'm so. Next. What is it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so close. It was what I call Flyman.
Blair, Natalie, Tootie, and Joe. Together, they formed the fresh-faced and funny core of the facts of life. Behind the scenes, they'd weathered everything from backstage battles to weight problems. On screen, the bubbly comedy took on some very tough issues, too. But sometimes delivering a big message caused the show to have an identity crisis. One of the challenges that the show faced was that at the same time that it was being this sort of silly sitcom, you know, it was also trying to impart these very serious messages. And sometimes it really didn't work. It's always hard to find a balance. How much are you going to have a moral? And how much funny do you have? First seasons, really, they had a lot of stuff, drugs, teen sex, teen pregnancy, runaways, things like that. What we called, uh, not too flatteringly, disease of the week. I'm having a little trouble with my hearing. What did the doctor say? I don't know. You couldn't hear him? <laughs> Will Tootie be deaf forever? We don't think so, but she's going to be deaf for this episode for about 10 minutes so that we can let you know the plight of deaf people or educate her. There was a suicide episode. It's Cynthia! <laughs> What's the matter with Cynthia? We went up to her room and she's unconscious. Unconscious? I found this empty bottle of pills on the floor. She must have taken them all. It was not universally popular with the network, uh, of which I was one of the people of the network saying, gee, it's not funny enough. We did some research and we presented it to the network and the network said but she lives right and my partner says we're not doing a show about an attempted suicide we're doing a show about a teen suicide the girl dies and there was silence in the room and then someone says where's the funny in that cynthia's dead don't say that it's not true Oh, yes. Who do it is? It sparked an enormous amount of fan mail we got about teen suicide. We got a letter from one girl who said that she had been secreting away her mother's sleeping pills for weeks, and she was planning to kill herself. And she was watching TV and writing her letters and had seen the episode. And, you know, I don't want to say that, like, you know, the girls talked her down. Like, I won't take that on, okay? But what I will say is, there was something really relatable for her, and she didn't feel alone. A lot of those message shows were a real good conduit for young people to start writing in and saying, you know, you know, can you introduce me to Todd Bridges, but also thanks, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's one of those. Like, I mean, I think we became part of people's lives in that way. In season two, Facts of Life didn't just introduce a disease of the week. They introduced a whole new character who embodied the plight of the physically handicapped, Blair's cousin, Jerry. The idea was to have a handicapped character in the show and, of course, make sure it was, in fact, someone who was handicapped, not someone playing someone handicapped. Jerry Jewell was, in real life, a young woman afflicted with cerebral palsy who was a stand-up comic. I was performing and Norman Lear was in my audience that night. We rode in the elevator to the parking garage later, and he said, you're going to go far, kid. I guess it was a matter of four months later, they wrote Cousin Jay, and I was born. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not drunk. I have cerebral palsy. When I'm drunk, I walk perfectly straight. <laughs> I think they wanted to do something important, and I don't know that the audience cared in the long run. When I look back on it, I was NBC's token actress for the disability. They tried very hard to get an Emmy with me, and they would never get the Emmy nomination for using me, and I think that was a part of the disappointment. And as quickly as it was given to me, it was taken away. Jerry was a daring attempt to address a tough issue on primetime, but one fact of life was almost too hot for the series to handle. We're talking about sex. Before we started the second season, we had a meeting with the producers. One of them said, and this next season, we're going to have Blair lose her virginity. It was one that obviously had been discussed for a long time. And the logical person, because she was the older of the girls, was Lisa. So I just remember, after everybody left that meeting, I kind of went up to one of the producers and just said, I can't do that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, and, and the Bible says you're supposed to wait till you get married, and I can't do it. And 
they were remarkably respectful of my beliefs and didn't write it. The Dirty Deed stayed out of the teen comedy that season, but four girls, nine years, it had to happen sooner or later. It was the last year that it, it surfaced again. It was just getting very weird. You can't have these girls having all these boyfriends and nobody does anything. It's just ridiculous. The next question was, well, who's going to do it? I went into the production office and I said, look, here's how I feel. Of course the pretty girl's going to get nailed. Everybody does that. You know, show them that cherry getting pop. Halfway through the season, Natalie lost her virginity. We are adults, so it just seemed natural to, you know. <laughs> and they found the perfect dude to do the job. Enter Snake. The character that she lost her uh, virginity to was played by Robert Honest, who had been in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, in which uh, he deflowered uh, young women. They were looking for somebody specifically for this certain character who was going to deflower uh, Natalie in the show. And uh, I guess I had a little track record at that. They said, we'd like you to be in a relationship. We'd like you to have a boyfriend. I said, that's fine. They took me to lunch before uh, one of the producers and said that they were going to write the Blair character to espouse abstinence in the show. I don't know if I made the right decision or not, but ultimately I asked to be totally written out of the episode. Lisa's apprehension at even doing an episode about it and promoting it was waylaid by my casualness of it. What was bothersome was at that point, there's a difference between you as a person and you as an actor. So it's the only episode that Blair doesn't appear. With Lisa Welchel boycotting the show, the infamous virginity episode aired on February 6th, 1988. Naturally, they put it in the sweeps because you always put your stunt episodes where the ratings are most important. It probably got a bit of attention for the show that it wouldn't have gotten otherwise. The sex episode might have raised more eyebrows backstage than in America's living rooms. But in season seven, the producers thought they had a surefire way to sex up the show. Hi. Hi. Enter handyman George Burnett, played by a struggling pretty boy named George Clooney. Yeah, that George Clooney. The producers and writers liked the idea and recognized the need to have a guy on the show. It was a little odd, I have to say, because I think he was too much older than the girls to be a real romantic interest. In hindsight, I'm mad that <laughs> they didn't make him a love interest, like, you know, as if I could have even been a candidate, having been the youngest. He had this cool Jeep, too. We would go in his Jeep to lunch, and he was the big brother. You know, I have often said that if I had known he was going to turn out as fine as he did, I may have worn makeup to the set more often. I thought he was cute. <laughs> a good-looking kid, and I didn't know anything about his talent because you couldn't tell by the show. If you watch his episodes, you understand why it took so long for him to become famous. It's not good work. Hi. George! Yeah, just stopped by to see how everything turned out. I think it was always like, you know, the joke was George enters. You know, from where to go, where's he going? Why is he here? Like, it was a joke, it was like, all we know is George has to enter, so enter. Knowing what he went on to, it's sort of ironic that he started on a sort of secondary role on a dying sitcom like Fax was. Coming up, the girls are rocked by a surprise departure. Everyone was panicked. What do we do? Yeah, it was a scary moment there for the show because they didn't know which way it was going. When Cast Confessions returns, While the facts of life tried spicing up the show with new cast members, they were about to lose the woman who'd started it all. Before season eight, Charlotte Ray made a shocking announcement. Oh, everyone was surprised, I think, when, when Charlotte wanted to leave. She was the heart of the show. I felt I had really looked into every nook and cranny of Mrs. Garrett, and the girls were getting older now. They wanted me to stay a couple more years. They offered me millions, and I wanted to move on. One of the reasons she left was that the shows really started to focus on the girls. The pull of the show started to be different, and for her, she sort of felt like, I'm done. 
I remember when Charlotte decided to leave that everyone was panicked. What do we do? Yeah, it was a scary moment there for the show because they didn't know which way it was going. What the producers wanted to do was not replace Mrs. Garrett and just have someone new play her, but they did want to introduce um, a new kind of maternal character. But who could replace the matronly and heartwarming Charlotte Ray? How about Emmy and Academy Award winning actress Cloris Leachman? They finally found the new character in Cloris Leachman, who played Beverly Ann Stickle, Mrs. Garrett's sister. Charlotte Ray was leaving, and I didn't want it to be awkward for anybody or uncomfortable. She bought engraved stationery that said Beverly Ann, and she wrote to us before she met us in each character. I think I just said, I'm coming, and I'll be there on such and such a date, and I can't wait to see you, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun. It was that kind of letter to each one. I still have my letter. Dear Natalie, I am in my Winnebago, driving to see you girls. I'm so nervous. I've heard so much about you over the years from Edna. But replacing a core character wasn't as easy as it seemed. Cloris came in with an entirely different persona, and she certainly wasn't the mom. I don't know that they knew how to write her either. It wasn't the same as Charlotte, because Charlotte had dealt with the girls when they were young. I think that the audience was not keen on somebody telling a 19-year-old how to run her life, you know, and somebody who was frankly a little ditzy. It was always a question, who am I to them and who should I be? So then they stopped having me advise them, but then what for me to do? Unfortunately, there was no time to figure that out. In 1988, after more than 200 episodes and without so much as a press release, Facts of Life was quietly canceled. I think those last couple years, Oh boy, you know, what were we doing still living together, really? And I think that's why our last episode, we all knew it was the last episode. They didn't really have, I don't think, an ending that satisfied the public. We had a sputtering start, we had a sputtering finish, and there was no closure to it. The show just kind of left quietly. Where was our mash? series finale and i'm certainly certainly before somebody says no you're not putting facts alive and mash in the same category no i'm not um, but my point is for the longevity and for the impact that we had with the audience it seemed like we could have had something it may not have gotten a fond farewell befitting a landmark tv show but some 20 years after it went off the air Blair, Joe, Tootie, Natalie, and Mrs. Garrett still resonate with fans. All I know is that when I bump into people, they love that show, they want a hug. That's it for me, it's, it's the people. I don't care about how they didn't honor us. The people honored us. And still to this day, right, 25 years later, for reals, I'm recognized just as much, still get really nice service everywhere, Still get perks every now and then. When I met Nelson Mandela's uh, daughter, Zinzi, and she says, you have no idea how you impacted the girls in South Africa. I mean, what? When I'm at home in New York and a cab driver, several, <laughs> several cab drivers on a monthly basis tell me how they learned to speak English because Fox of Life was one of the shows that they watch. In all honesty, that was a wonderful time of my life to come to the set every day to hang out with these girls that were like sisters. I mean, who wouldn't love that? I think that with age, that guilty pleasure is kind of like our badge of honor. Like, not to get too nostalgic, but at least we're getting it. And I think that it's well-deserved. I really do. I really do. I'm excited to go down memory lane. How nice, while well, I still have my memory. It's been a long time. We're gonna need to, don't, don't use that. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I need to 
watch the special today, don't I? <laughs>